Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Jeff Kirsch of Kirsch Drums. Jeff, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm, it's an honor. Yeah, man. I've been, uh, I've been following you on social media for, for I feel like a long time, just because I've, I've enjoyed everything you're doing. And then um, just by chance, um, Mr. Dave Chapman who's a listener of the show, recommended that you uh, be a guest. And here we are. We were talking and uh, on, I think we just messaged each other. And now now we're, we're, we're here recording. So it's funny how the world works like that. Oh, man, it's great. I've been listening to you for years now. Oh, awesome. That's cool to hear. So uh, you know how the, the show flows then. So we won't, uh, we won't take too long to hop into the, um, the topic like we do on the show. So um, and I also want to say too, Mr. Richie Pace, uh, who I've talked to before, who's a very nice guy, he recommended um, a, an episode talking about wood and wood t- types and how it affects shells. And I think we can kind of check that one off as well in this episode um, and kind of kill two birds with one stone. So yeah, on that note, what we're here to talk about um, is something that you're really kind of known for is bearing edges and really being an expert on shell types and construction, both vintage and modern. Um, So why don't we take it one thing at a time and just start off with a conversation about bearing edges. Why don't you kick it off with what they are, why they're important and how they are, you know, they vary drum to drum. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. It pretty much, uh, I would say that the bearing edges is 90% of what a drum does. If bearing edges aren't really correct, then you're not interacting with the shell to get whatever makes that shell unique. And so bearing edges has really been where I started with drum building. It started with a very expensive name brand kit uh, that I got in debt to own. (laughs) <laughs> and and uh, could not tune. And so that kit sat stacked in a corner while I was making payments on it. And, um, and I found it really frustrating. And so that's when I got into bearing edges and, and, and understanding what it is that they do. And essentially, the bearing edge is kind of a lost art when someone like George Way spends time developing a bearing edge shape that's going to be the character of the the brand uh, and then sells the company to so-and-so, so-and-so becomes a a manufacturing expert more than a drum expert. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's kind of a tendency for efficiency to take over uh, what was done by the most expensive person in the building, the woodworker, the, the talented, uh, skilled, experienced designer. And, and, and it's commonly known in, in guitars. I don't know a single guitar player who pulls a guitar out of a box and goes into the studio with it. Yeah. It's, it's, um, there's a thing that's happened in, the guitar industry and a lot of other acoustic instrument industries where they say, look, we've built you the most solid foundation that we can. You're probably going to want to take this to a tech and get the last of the details dialed in. Mm. Uh, The Fender factory doesn't have uh, an 80 to $120 an hour uh, uh, setup guy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and they, I would imagine everyone has different taste where out of the factory, they can't exactly know what every single person would want. Right. Well, and that's an interesting part of it is that it's, it's less about taste and more about function. Um, taste is something that, that you choose in, in the foundation, like whether or not you go with a Gibson or a Fender or uh, w- one of the other brands or one of the different wood types, but, None of them are intonated, uh, which is where the the parts are are adjusted to make sure that high tones are in tune with low tones. Mm-hmm. Um, 
the frets aren't dressed. They're a little rough. It's not going to be as fun for a guitar player to play. And so it's, it's more about uh, function at first. And then you can customize all you want from there. But uh, they're, they're functionally limited, straight out of the box. You could not take a brand new Fender out of, out of the box and use it in the studio without the engineer getting irritated. And, yeah. But how, and, how does that apply, though? Because I feel like guitar is sort of different from drums. At least I've always thought it is. But how does that same, you know, setting it up, you take your drums out. I've, I've always thought it was a little, I don't know, maybe guitar is more particular than drums. But what, what do you, how does all everything you just said kind of in the, you know, guitar world, how does that apply to a brand new drum set. Do you need to get your bearing, bearing edges checked and cut on a, every brand new drum set? Uh, not every brand new drum set. It, it depends on who you're going to, which company you're going to. Uh, some companies have carried on their legacy designs um, and other companies have abandoned them. And, and normally I think it's for efficiencies. Uh, but the way it compares is that it's the same factory. In some cases, it's the same parent company um, who set up their their assembly lines for efficiency, for for profit margin, and and you know not that profit is bad. Everyone has to pay their bills, mm-hmm. but there's it. It's true what you're saying that a guitar is more particular in the sense that. If it doesn't function properly, you cannot use it. Yeah. Where a drum will still make sound, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and that sound is going to be enjoyable to somebody. Sure. And so it's, it's, uh, it's more forgiving in that sense. But I find that drummers, uh, I mean, part of the reason your show exists is, is drummers are out there almost desperately seeking information on how to get the character and the sound they want out of their drums. And, um, you know, it, anything works as a drum. I've used a cardboard box with a mic in it for a yeah. bass drum yeah. in, in a pinch, a coffee um, tin or whatever flipped over. I mean, we've all been at some family event or a party where they're like, uh, I was that I had, I used a Folgers mug once when someone was playing violin and they were like, Bart, play the drums. And it's like, all right, <laughs> I'll just use this, I guess, you know? Yeah. And, and, be, and because that works, you know, if you can keep time, uh, you know, on a countertop, yeah. you're going to be able to add something to the music. And, and, and because of that, there's, there's a, there's a larger ability for drum companies to make claims that a guitar manufacturer or violin manufacturer couldn't get away with. And really like they're, they're all acoustic instruments. Mm -hmm. They're all functioning. You know, the drums don't have pickups. They are a hollow body acoustic instrument, the same as a guitar or violin. And, and that's really why I draw the comparison so often is, is because the, the, the physics are the same. It's just the tolerances are different. Yeah. So, all right, let's real quick. I just want to kind of narrow this down a little bit, or I guess like zoom in a little bit. So, all right, bearing edges, it's sort of a thing. I almost feel like, I don't want to say a dark art where, where there's like a little bit of this, like, you know, maybe to the untrained ear, someone doesn't know what they're listening to. What can a drummer... Um, who's not a guy like you, who was working on this all the time and who has a trained ear, what can they listen for to know that maybe there's an issue with their bearing edge? What would be some um, some red flags going on? Because, I mean, really, I think everyone thinks out there, I just bought, you know, a $2,000 drum set that I'm, you know, like you said, I'm maybe, you know, you finance this thing and it's not, it's not what, you want it. It's not going well. What, what are some of those red flags that people can look out for? Well, it's surprisingly less tonal. Like if like using again, the guitar as an example, if you've got a guitar with a bent neck or worn frets, or it's not intonated, um, it's not 
well, the intonation is, but it's not so much of a sound issue as a function one. Hmm. You can have a guitar that's in tune, but still feels terrible to play. The, the response of the player is limited by how the instrument feels. Yeah. He can't, can't play as fast. Hmm. Um, tuning doesn't stay in tune as long. So maybe you're halfway through a song in the recording studio and the instrument goes out of tune and now you have to punch in or start the song all over again. And, and so a lot of the struggles that I find drummers have are not necessarily related to the tone. They, they, they like their drum set. There's just something missing and usually it's functional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, can the thing go through a song uh, all the way through or a set all the way through without retuning? Can you uh, disassemble the drum, put a new head on, reassemble it, and get the sound that you had before that you took an hour and a half to figure out how to get? You know, and So most of what Bearing Edges does is functional, and the tonal benefits are sort of um, the icing on the cake. Now, what is the, you know, in, in, you know, I know I'm sure we could talk about this next question for an hour, but how would you explain kind of in, uh, you know, layman's terms, the science behind that? Obviously, we know it's where the, the edge of the drum comes in contact with the head. What, yeah. what, what constitutes a bad bearing edge? Is it not even, is it, you know, not sharp in one point and then it's rounded in another? How, how does it leave a world renowned factory? You know, what, again, what all that, all that stuff is one, one weird, weirdly shaped question right there. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because obviously if you buy a, an American made Fender guitar, it is leaving a world renowned factory. Uh, but it's not done yet. It's not a complete instrument. Hmm. But guitar companies are cool with that, and and guitar players are cool with that. It's an open relationship that they have. Um, your your guitar player will go out buy a brand new American Fender and drive straight to his tech, and and the the idea that um, any mass production facility finishes the details is, is a myth. Like they, they just don't do it and they can't do it. There's no way that they could have say at Fender, they couldn't have a uh, 80 to $120 an hour setup guys uh, perfectly dialing in 10,000 guitars a week or whatever they're mm-hmm. producing. And it's the same with drums. They have to do what will get these things in, into their guitar center contracts that they have to fulfill as quickly as possible. And, and so they literally cut corners, but essentially the history behind the bearing edge is that you have animal hide heads Mm -hmm. and you can take an animal hide head. You can stretch that over a log that's been hollowed by a hatchet with zero precision um, you could stretch that hide head over a triangle shaped drum, a square drum, a round drum. Like nothing ever really mattered in drums for precision when it came to animal hide heads. This this whole thing is is actually fairly brand new. And is that beca- uh, from I learned I learned from Jeff Stern on a recent episode? The skin then will form around that shape and kind of seal to that whatever. Uh, you know, because it's skin. Is that basically right? Yeah, exactly. And and a a piece of molded plastic that's under heat and pressure is it's never going to take another shape. It is going to fight taking another shape, no matter what you do. It's you could take a two liter bottle and you can squeeze it and crush it, and it's just going to pop right back out into its original shape. Mm-hmm. And in a, in a sense, that's what the drum heads are doing. And when when the head first got invented, you had these guys who were uh, very excited about the possibility of of not having to deal with all the issues involved in 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 calf heads, and also the the increase in volume. 
and and resonance you know as the amplifiers are getting bigger you know people are trying to figure out how to get the same volume and um and compete and you know be sure. audible in these arenas and 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 so you have these guys they they go down to the head factory and measure the shape that the heads are being molded at and go back to their drum building factories and start cutting that shape hmm. into the edge of the drums, knowing full well that you're, you're not going to make plastic head reshape. Um, maybe at jazz tensions at um, snare drums can get away with it mm -hmm. um, because you're getting enough tension to start pulling all of that out. But yeah. for the most part, a plastic head is never going to take another shape. And so you've got somebody at, you know, Gretsch or Camco or Rogers, and these guys create different bearing edges that are similarly shaped for the time. And that shape is very similar to how Remo was molding the heads and how Evans was molding the heads in their factories. And, hmm. and, um, and then they, they, they put these into their brands, this, this edge shape, and it's usually rounded on the outside. And uh, as companies get bought and as the original designer engineer is, is long gone and an efficiency expert says, well, why are we doing, you know, double the work on this? Yeah. Um, when we can just do this single cut, super fast one operation can be done by a kid who's never run a router in his life and he can cut bearing edges all day long yeah and it's it's called a bearing edge but and that's one of the things that that really gets left out is it's called a bearing edge not because it bears the tension of the head or it bears the playing but because it's actually supposed to function as a bearing in a wheel huh for the head to roll tight and roll loose. Sure. It's rolling across this bearing edge, high tension, low tension, rolling, always supported and rolling on that edge. Hmm. As soon as you make that edge razor sharp, you're asking the head to crease at each note. And it's just not something the drum head wants to do. Yeah. Now, all right, so... um my question for that would be so backing up a little bit. So in the, f I guess we could say late fifties ish, uh, when the, you know, the Mylar heads were coming out, this wasn't like something where, you know, kids were watching Ringo and going, Oh man, I wonder what bearing edges these were. It, it almost <laughs> seems like it wasn't brought into like, it wasn't like a marketing term until Years later, obviously, were, were, were all were the big, you know, all the various companies, were they using different bearing edge types? And I, I, I do want to cover what they are. You have like the baseball bat and all that stuff. Did each company kind of have their own, let, let's say in the heyday before maybe they got, you know, simplified by the corporate people who were, you know, came in. But w would they have their own patented bearing edge to make it their own sound? company to company? I think it was just to them, it was just a very basic function and it, and the conversation about bearing edges really didn't come up until these, these edges got lost. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and people really started to struggle in the way that, that, uh, you, you might not with a, with a Rogers or a Camco and, you know, you buy this brand new, uh, you know, nineties or two thousands is, is pretty much when a lot of the, the conversation started when the, I would say issues, mm -hmm. uh, started. And, and so, uh, the legacy guys seem to have just done what was necessary and didn't really make a big deal out of it. I, I can't find any vintage advertising about how bearing edges are. And, and most yeah. of what I've learned about bearing edges pretty much all comes from 20 years of taking people's drums apart sure, and, and putting them back together. And the, uh, the customer feedback has created what I know more than anything else. Yeah. So, um, 
All right. I want to get into the different bearing edge styles, but so I don't forget, I want to ask you, does a bearing edge over time go bad? Like, do you need to do routine maintenance on your bearing edges or are they, you know, if they're right when they're out of the factory or they got the bearing edges kind of recut 30 years ago or whatever, do you need to get them touched up over time? It depends largely on the woods. Okay. Um, maple and birch and a lot of the hardwoods, uh, they'll hold their same bearing edge almost forever. Um, you know, there were a lot of drums that were uh, ruined in the concert Tom days hmm. where bottom heads were taken off and, and, you know, it didn't take too long for the Tom to drag across that bass drum tension rod at the top of the kick yeah, and have the bottom edges torn out of them. Uh-huh. Uh, but, but usually what happens is, is, is the old three ply Ludwigs and Slinger ones. Those are probably the most um, needing of maintenance because the bearing edge sits on top of a vertical grain poplar. It's a very soft wood, and it's the wood where the uh, – like if you're going to chop a log, you chop it on the end grain, and the log just splits. Mm-hmm. If you turn a log sideways and you try to chop it that way, it's going to take you forever to get through that log. And and bearing edges on the old Ludwigs and Slingerlands – our end grain sitting up and you have the head sitting on top of that. And because that's how the tree drank originally, uh, moisture is sucked into there, your beer and your sweat and, you know, (laughs) just years of, uh, you know, steamy basements. Sure. Um, The, the, the end of those, shells ludwig and slingerland in particular that that poplar core um those flatten over time Hmm. those definitely do and and people do a lot of crazy stuff to try to preserve them and 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 that's one of those things where it's like dented frets on a fender yeah you don't just like leave them that way because on a fender it's unplayable if Mm -hmm. the frets are dented but on a drum you could still get a sound yeah. You know, and it's and when it comes to the three plies, that's one of the things that drives me crazy. Like, oh, you know, I love this snare because it's the Ringo sound, and it's like, well, Ringo was playing a brand new drum. <laughs> yeah, his drum didn't <laughs> have dented bearing edges. It didn't have fifty years of wood rot. It wasn't uh, uh, plies yeah. delaminating from each other, and so um, there's kind of a superstition about. Uh, not restoring uh, vintage bearing edges. Yeah, you read and, my mind. I was just going to say, I mean, it seems almost like that's the way it is. Uh, you know, she's an old girl. Leave her how she is. Like, but that's not true. You're saying you can, you can, it's wood. Like you could recut. And again, I don't have much experience. I've never had drums recut or anything. So this is all like pretty fascinating. Um, you can fix it i mean even if it's a 1963 whatever ludwig kit it'll cut just like a new drum right oh exactly like they did there was a a time period where people were modernizing them and they were trying to get these old uh poplar drums to sound modern and it didn't work you can't really put a razor sharp 90s bearing edge on a vintage ludwig and and make that actually uh, sound could. Yeah. And so sure. there were people who really hacked up uh, some vintage Ludwigs and I'm, I'm still fixing those today. So the important thing to remember is there's a difference between modifying a bearing edge and restoring one. You know, gotcha. you wouldn't, you wouldn't take a vintage instrument like a guitar or a violin and, and, um, and try to make it into something else. No. Um, the goal is is to actually restore bearing edges, and there's there's not a lot of people that are doing that correctly. And even if you say you take an old vintage drum and you want to restore the bearing edges on it, say it's your example of the 63 Ludwig. Mm-hmm. 
if you're wanting to restore the original edges on that, Ludwig went through a period where their edges changed to various degrees five or six times. And so which Ludwig edge do you want to reproduce? (laughs) Interesting. And, you know, there was a time period where, and this was Leedy Ludwig area and going into right before they were mass producing to supply rock and roll with Mm -hmm. drum sets, you know, in every basement and garage across the planet. They, they, they were very focused, more handcrafted, details they would file out parts of the shell where the reinforcement ring created a hump Hmm. they would file out humps created where the old three ply shells overlap each other and put a very big hump in the bearing edge and Hmm. by 67 they just didn't have time to do this anymore yeah, so that was some extreme attention to detail, but obviously for for let's say Ludwig in particular, I mean, and I guess drums just across the board got more popular. I guess you just can't do that. And that, but that's, but let's, you know, we'll talk about this more later, later in the episode. But that's where I guess it pays to use like a smaller shop, um, almost like you know, let's say like Kirsch Drums, <laughs> where there's that attention to detail. But I, I see that how. You can't almost expect them to do that, but but I think they did pretty damn good for the amount of drums that a lot of these companies were putting out. Um, obviously, there's some misses here and there, but it seems like overall they did they did a pretty good job. Is that fair to say? Oh, certainly. I mean, for what they had to work with, <laughs> yeah. In the in the sense that uh, the 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 Ludwig Slingerland shell is a 300 year old design. Mm-hmm. You know, it goes, it goes, it goes back to uh, the drum needing to be easy to carry, uh, yeah. uh, lightweight, uh, but still huge uh, to be able to project its sound. I mean, they were using these, these things to direct battle. You know, yeah, <laughs> and, absolutely. It's, it's different. and so it was a completely different priority when when uh, when we switched over to kits. Because yeah. the, the, the first kits, you're talking about uh, rack toms from Asia, mm-hmm. a, a bass drum from classical or marching, a, uh, a, a floor tom made from a Civil War marching drum. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And it was this, this hodgepodge of things, uh, kind of ancient, ancient technologies. And but so it's a blueprint, though, which which kind of like you look at it and then you go, Oh, I, it's like evolution. You know, it's like, you see like the, like the K the monkey turning into the caveman, into the modern man. It's like, it starts with that and then it evolves into something more. And, uh, yeah. And I've been yeah. like an archeologist of this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm literally like, like digging through these crusty old pieces of history and, and, and gleaning everything I can from them about like, Oh, well in 1957, they filed these humps out. And then Hmm. by 67, they, they weren't touching them. They were packaging them up, getting them out as quick as they can. And, and, and they had, I think Ludwig and Slingerland's problem and Slingerland didn't survive it. And I'm not sure how Ludwig did, but everyone else had moved on to really advanced technology compared um you know the idea of taking hardwoods and cross graining the plies and cooking those under heat and pressure and making finally having something that's as solid and resonant thin responsive musical as an acoustic guitar or violin you know that didn't happen until plywood yeah. That that you could get something that would stay flawlessly round without extra material rings. You know, uh, a Ludwig didn't have reinforcement rings for tonal reasons. They no. never decided like let's put these puppies in there because it's going to create a fatter tone and more resonance or this that mm-hmm. or the other. It was it was none of that. It's how do we keep this head from crushing a very thin lightweight drum? Yeah. Uh, when it's left out in the sun, uh, the reinforcement rings are a, a stopgap. They're they're an emergency 
uh, protection. Yeah, and I think I heard someone on a really early episode of the show call it like an insurance policy. Where like if it's going to happen, you know, okay, we have this this ring here to stop it. You know, it, it sort of buys you that little bit of like you know, it might not happen, but it boom, you got that that um, that ring there, which. I honestly feel like that's getting into the shell territory, which I'm excited to talk about. But I, yeah. I, before we get there, I want to, and again, I know we're jamming a lot into one episode, but I want to ask you here for a quick rundown of the various bearing edge types. You mentioned the razor sharp nineties, um, you know, style. So, so maybe you can go down chronologically going back in time, uh, with what kind of bearing edges people would find, on drums and maybe what that sound produces. And I'm sure this could be, again, another hour long conversation in itself. So you can keep it kind of high level, but yeah, what, what are the different types and what does that sound produce? Well, it seemed like when, um, when the kit was first starting out, uh, bearing edges were really, really round, like very fat. And the more contact you have with the shell, there's pros and cons. If you're contacting the shell heavily and it's a soft wood shell, then shell essentially becomes absorbative. If it's a hardwood shell, the shell projects mm. what's happening from the communication with the drum head. And so it seemed like uh, the animal hide head worked the same regardless of what you're edges are yeah and so it really didn't start becoming a, a a tonal factor until the plastic heads and so early ludwig slingerland style shell uh and and say like famous drums like the radio king very very fat rounded bearing edges and this became kind of a problem as the amps got huge and people wanted more and more volume they started going to brands like Rogers and Gretsch and Camco because these guys were doing essentially the, if you take a Remo or Evans drum head and you look at the molded rounded shape on the outside edge, that is um, Camco, Rogers and Gretsch kind of reproduced that shape. Hmm. And then to, have less contact with the shell and make more resonance, they cut off the rounded inside part of the bearing edge. Because the bearing edge essentially has two parts, the inside and the outside. Sure. The inside, people will talk about 30 degree, 40 mm -hmm. degree, you know, all these. It's not contacting the head. The head has no idea, the tone has no idea if the inside edge is 30 degrees or 45 degrees or anything, mm -hmm. it really starts to matter when you round over the inside edge because you can start to use the peak of the shell in the same way you'd use one of those plastic zero rings where the peak of the edge is actually making it enough contact of with the head to kind of focus it, yeah, absorb some of the overtones and so that got to be too mellow and too quiet for rock and roll. So people started 45ing, 30, doesn't matter. They started cutting the insides sharp to allow the playing surface of the drum head to ring out louder and longer and get through the mix. And so that, that 45 or 30 is kind of what started what happened in the 90s. So people started sharpening these edges even more. And um, there was a pretty split group. When, it, when I started building in 98, there was a pretty split forum conversation. I used to get on the drum forums and talk about this <laughs> stuff with a lot of people, and we would argue and argue. Yeah, And, uh, you know, it was a pretty big debate between single 45 and double 45. Expo so single would mean one side is 45 versus all, yeah, all, cut all the way to the outside of the shell. Hmm. And the problem that this, this creates, and, and this is kind of one of the frustrating things for me. Uh, you will see companies talk about, 
our shells are leveled so precisely that not even light gets through. <laughs> but meanwhile, that shell is so over diametered that the head is never going to sit flat, even though you have a flawlessly flat surface. You drop the head on there and the head is rocking back and forth from side to side. It's rotating in a sense, trying to find a place where it can drop down hmm. and actually sit on the drum. Because if you're contacting the, the drum head where it is still rising up and rounding over to the actual part you're going to hit, then you kind of end up with that rounded area in the playing surface, almost acting how a rubber surround on a speaker will float the cone. Yeah. You end up with this pre-molded rounded shape in your playing surface. So you can sit there and you'll tune it and do, 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 like all your pitches will match. And then you'll strike that drum and it will finally pull that floating collar flat. It's an unpleasant experience. It doesn't feel good to play. It's why your snare probably feels a lot better to play than your toms do. Mm. Because there's a pitch when that head finally gets stretched all the way, and then it springs back to the pitch that you tuned it at. So there's a kind of bow wow mm. of, the, of the head having, in a sense, two different notes. The one you tuned it at and the one that it finally bottoms out at yeah. because the head is floating. So outside diameter is dramatically more important than how level I would take an unlevel bearing edge that's inside diameter over, um, over a flawlessly leveled shell that is too big around for the head to see. Uh, like a perfect example. I get people telling me this a lot. Um, I have a vintage Premier or a vintage Sonar with single 45s, and it tunes great, stays in tune great, and plays beautifully. But those shells are under-diametered. Hmm. They are not big around as a uh, Keller shell or uh, a DW or a, you know American-made drum set. They're not as big around as the Asian kits. Hmm. They're they're undersized. They specifically have lugs made that are taller to compensate for the undersized shell. That's this this whole over diameter, under diameter. I mean, it's kind of like I feel like I've never even really heard of this or, you know, ha I've never heard this discussion. So, I mean, we're, we have to be talking, obviously, by a small diameter. Right. I mean, we're not it's not a half an inch or something like that. It's millimeters. Right. I mean, like we're talking a small little bit but it, it obviously that adds up to a big uh difference but right yeah it's it's small enough uh but impactful enough that yeah that the difference say between where a drum head collar is coming up you know the head is coming up out of the metal ring and starting to round over and the distance from where it's starting to round over to where it actually goes flat and level hmm. is is very minimal. It's a very small difference. Sure, but it's a it's a it's a huge difference for stick rebound. Yeah, head uh, head life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, tuning range, and so it really it doesn't take very much. And and like another example is, uh, you know, the pork pies in the Orange counties. 90s mm -hmm. um legendary for tons of volume tons of sustain not a big problem to tune and that is because at that time there was the double 45 or single 45 debate and the double 45 actually brings your diameter in enough if you're peaking say you've got an eight ply keller shell and you 45 the outside four plies and the inside four plies, you're going to sit right at the flat point of the drum head, the perfect point of the drum head. Um, you still have the problem of trying to crease a drum at every note, tr cre uh, crease a drum head at every note. Sure. Uh, 
you're you're not having that supported roll tight roll loose of of a an earlier Gretsch or Rogers or Camco. Uh, but that, that kind of bearing edge is a lot of work and a lot of skill. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 it kind of went out the window. There were a few companies and, and this is also why you see the huge boom of the import kits that started out as, I mean, junk. They were, they were junky copies of uh, Slingerlands and Gretsch's and, and uh, Rogers, um, yeah. but they kept developing and they kept developing. And they kept dev- by the late seventies, early eighties. You really couldn't buy an American kit that was better than a Japanese one. Yeah, and that's been talked yeah. about a, a fair amount. I mean, they're they really they did their homework. Um, they they copied and copied and copied and developed and 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 did a really good job. And God, I mean. Japanese drums are some of the finest drums made. I mean, it's, it's, there's, you know, tons of great brands all over the world, but they definitely earned their place, I think, uh, in the world of, you know, drum sets. Oh, it's, it's just astounding what they did because they took everything that these companies were missing and, and added it. And especially when it comes to bearing edges, you know, there was a, the the big the big epiphany for me was so that expensive american uh, name brand kit that i got into debt for sat in the corner uh while i played my uh tama rockstar pearl export yep uh mix sure kit and uh my girlfriend at the time was not happy that we were in debt on this kit that I wasn't even playing, <laughs> wasn't gigging with. Um, so what I ended up doing was I traded with a friend for a 79 Yamaha recording custom. Nice. And what made this kit special, he just saw it as a, as a, you know, beat up old Yamaha. And I sat with the thing and I could tune it and I, and, and it would stay in tune for gigs and, just always produce this beautiful sound. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, I played the kit for about a month and I was like, God, I sure hope he wants to trade. Cause I do not want that other kid anymore. <laughs> and, uh, and he did. And we traded and I had to find out, uh, why I would have this experience where a beat up old Yamaha would be more fun than a brand new top of the line, heavily advertised kit. So I took it apart and really examined the bearing edges. And, and now what I've learned is, is that uh, Sakai, who was pretty much the designer, engineer of everything that Yamaha was doing, mm-hmm. took a bearing edge from the marching drum department. And that bearing edge was pretty rounded, almost fully rounded. Wow. Because at the, the tensions of a marching drum – you, you can't have a razor sharp bearing edge. You're just going to cut right through the head and, um, and break things. So he took this rounded marching bearing drum edge and put it on a kit. And that was the nine thousands. Wow. Which are iconic <laughs> and pr- yeah. I mean, on pretty much, you know, probably more recordings than, uh, than most other drum sets. Um, yeah, and, that, and that's how they got named the recording custom. It, they didn't start out with that name. Yeah, sure. They were so popular with recording studios and recording drummers, you know, the Gads and Garibaldi's, all those cats, um, that they renamed the kit recording custom and put, you know, a new log on it to kind of like get it to to be a standalone model. Yeah, yeah. Same shell as a Birch custom. The only difference is the bearing edge. People will say, well, the lugs do this and do that. They really don't. It's uh, what made the recording customs sought after was that even an engineer who's never played drums could tune a Yamaha recording custom, the 79, because the head and the shell were the same shape. So you're not spending your tuning tension to reshape the head. And then once you've reshaped the head, now you can work on pitch 
the two things just went together. So as soon as you start tuning, turning drum keys, you are changing pitch. Yeah. I mean, that's what you would expect from a pro drum set, but obviously that's from what, from everything we've talked about, that's not the case. Well, it, it has been a little bit more lately. Yeah. Um, company companies are, are, you know, cause there's more than a few people like me who are out here redoing brand sparing edges, mm-hmm. um, daily. And, um, I think they're picking up on it and starting to respond. Like Ludwig has had some really impressive edges lately. Um, a lot of, a lot of the companies are kind of revisiting the subject because, you know, while all the Japanese companies were developing these technologies, um, from older American kits, those American companies were being bought and sold and bought and sold. Um, manufacturing experts trying to come in and figure out how to make these things profitable to compete with the Japanese. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and so a lot of the information was lost. A lot of the hands on, um, you know, gigging drummer who designs a bearing edge. A lot of that stuff was lost. And, um, but now it's be it's being revisited. There, there's a definitely uh, been some good quality lately. Well, that's good. I mean, it's guys like you who are bringing attention to it, and and like you said, there's a lot of great, uh, you know, people such as yourself working things out and getting it all, um, you know, bringing it bringing it to the forefront, uh, especially like this. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols. Dream Symbols is launching the Tasting Tour 2021. There's going to be tons of cool symbols, members of the Dream Team on site, and the recycling program will be in effect all day at these various awesome music stores around the country. October 2nd, they'll be at Forks Drum Closet in Nashville. October 9th, Melody Music in Bloomington, Indiana. October 16th, Rhythm Traders at Portland, Oregon. And November 6th, they'll be at Rupp Strums in Denver, Colorado. So go out and check it out if Dream will be in your town. Obviously, we could talk about shell types and the history and wood and all this stuff forever. But let's, I don't know, we got about 15 minutes or so left, um, 20 minutes. Let's talk a little bit about shells um, and wood construction and and maybe like early on, you and I, before we started, we're talking about modern versus vintage um, so maybe we just kind of pick a little bit of, uh, you know, we pick away at this. This is, let's say, you know down the line, maybe we'll do another episode. I think wood in general has got to be a multi, you know, it'll come oh, up yeah. a lot, but so, yeah. so let's talk about, you know, modern shells versus vintage shells. Um, you know, the construction plies, maybe what did we see in the, you know, fifties, we can go back as far as we want, but you know, the three ply getting into the six ply. What? Yeah. What's the difference between all of it? Well, I really break everything up into two categories. The, the, the pre-plastic head and post-plastic head. But, but, it, but in a sense, uh, there's plywood shells, which are what I would call the modern shell. Mm-hmm. So really a modern drum shell started with the Jasper shell builders. The, the guys... Uh, Gretsch, Rogers, Camco. Again, like to me, those are modern drums. They might have been built in the 60s, but they are, for all intents and purposes, uh, they're, they're, they're modern drums. Yeah. They've just gotten some age on them. There is very little that's changed between a 60s Gretsch and a Gretsch today. But there is a ton that has changed from a Ludwig or Slingerland to today's drums uh like the modern shell didn't really need reinforcement rings because you weren't having a head uh shrink in the trunk of the car and crush the drum and so reinforcement rings were pretty much ditched uh in a company like uh, dw's modern shells they're entirely symbolic they're Mm -hmm. they have you know zero function sure and it's it's uh so essentially to me there's there's only two 
types of drum shell. There's the vintage, which I would consider a Civil War drum, a uh, Ludwiger Slingerland, a Poplar core, because Poplar is easy to bend without steaming. It's uh, lightweight. There's not a lot of work into making a drum out of Poplar. And that's that's also why it's used in the the cheapest entry level kits, Luan, Poplar. Yeah. Uh, that goes under dozens of different names. Sure. But I, all the, I'm not trying to disparage that old style of construction because that's the only way you're going to get that sound. And I feel like everyone should have a softwood kit and a hardwood kit because they do different things. But the, um, the softwood kit is more of an absorber. The soft shell will absorb what is happening. And I, and I fit more with, say, upright basses and fiddles and all the instruments that have come back today, which is why I think these uh, Ludwigs and Slingerlands have come back today. Because if yeah. you take your Tama Imperial star and show up at, at a gig with an upright bass and a fiddle, um, you're going to bother those people. You're going <laughs> yeah. you're gonna, to you're gonna crush right through the mix and, and be too loud. And so I think that as volumes have decreased, uh, people recording at home, Mm-hmm. Um, and for social media, like all of a sudden these, these kits that were almost irrelevant to some degree, um, are now very relevant again and five times as expensive as they used to be. Yeah. God, I wish, I, wish I had bought all those $300 Ludwigs I had an opportunity for. Yeah. Now. All right. So my, you know, again, there's a million things we could talk about here in a kind of a short time, but My question would be, though, when we talk about the, um, you know, the the having a a poplar or like the gum, like the shell, like the the core where they do, you know, different woods kind of uh, like plied together, obviously plied. But why? What like what is the the benefit of that to have that that, you know, that poplar in the middle? Um, Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, in the case of the three ply shells, the Ludwigs and Slingerlands, the the purpose of the poplar was to be the majority of the drum, hmm. and to not the plywood technology didn't really exist. There, there, there were people who would say, uh, "Build a desk or a coffee table out of poplar," and that's not very appealing to look at. So it would get veneered with mahogany or maple or gotcha. some. F- you know, kind of flamed wood yeah. to look really nice because poplar's ugly. But the majority, although there's there's some there's some modern poplar stuff that's looking really nice. But yeah, yeah. In the in the case of the Ludwigs and Slingerlands, it was it was not a pretty wood and it, it didn't it wasn't something that you could put a pretty finish on and, and make a an appealing uh, instrument out of. So they would put the mahogany or maple, uh, sometimes even birch uh, whatever they could source because veneers were not, you know, hugely mass produced then mm-hmm. either. In a lot of cases, Ludwig would use whatever veneer they could get. And to them, it made no tonal issue because it's a poplar drum. It's a poplar drum with a cosmetic ply of maple or a cosmetic ply of mahogany. Mm-hmm. And, and they didn't see it as something that was going to create a tonal difference So later on, as people started asking, hey, you know, I bought this kit from you and one of the drums has maple in it. The other one has pop or mahogany in it. Is that okay?" Just to avoid that question, they just start painting white on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. They're just hiding it. They're like, this is not important. You guys are focusing on the wrong thing. (laughs) It's a it's a poplar drum. And, and so, yeah, but people do claim that, that those various paints have tonal differences. I think, um, yeah. And, th- and that's another one of those huge myths that, that bugs me. Yeah. Uh, f- physics has no way to, to tell if the paint is silver or gold or pink. There's, there's, there's no tonal, there is a tonal difference in a sense. I mean, dog ear kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> I don't know how anyone can claim, but if you take a drum 
or an acoustic guitar or a violin and you buff and gloss the inside of that instrument, it's going to be bright. Mm -hmm. It's going to be twangy and loud. And if you leave the insides rough and textured, which you'll find most acoustic instruments are rough inside, they don't do anything but seal them from moisture. In a lot of cases, they'll even leave their chisel marks and their planing marks Mm -hmm. just, just to give that just to show that it's handmade. And so there, the, the acoustic difference on the interior is the same as it would be in a recording studio uh, on the walls. If you're using a lot of absorptive material, then the sound is shorter, Mm -hmm. warmer. If you're using a brighter material or a reflective material, it's brighter and ringier. And, and so there are a couple of, like the Zola coat inside Rogers, uh, the textury spray coat, mm-hmm, yeah, uh, that Tama later used. Uh, a lot those of big companies- rockers, rocker twos had that kind of like, uh, what do you call it, gray kind of uh, gravelly look inside of them. That was, you know, yeah, yeah. That's that's a texture coat, and that's and that's an attempt, like the same way as a recording studio puts texture on the walls that's just trying to warm up uh the resonance because they were trying to increase volume but still have some warmth and those those can be a bit of a trade-off and so the but interior coating um you know it's it would be the to use a recording studio analogy if the walls were painted pink or the walls were painted silver (laughs) it's 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 not going to create any difference whatsoever it's yeah. It's just a way to hide the fact that all of the Jasper shell builders, Keller, uh, Keller came later with full plies. But if you take Gretsch, Rogers, or Camco, and you pull the, all of them were wrapped for one. You couldn't actually, no one gets to see the construction of a Jasper shell because it's hidden by all of all the companies. Jasper didn't have full sheets of ply when they molded the shells. So if it's a 16 inch deep floor tom, they would stick together three, eight inch deep sheets to try to, or two, eight inch deep sheets Mm. to try to make a full 16 inch sheet of veneer. And then they would wrap that into their molds and they would create a shell. And so when you're buying the equivalent of a $6,000 drum set at the time and you look inside and you see that they're not even using full sheets of veneer, uh, that can be kind of a problem for some people. So what most of the companies did, Gretsch put silver over it. Um, uh, Camco used like a dark kind of tan, I think, for a little while. Rogers used uh, a flat gray at first and then moved to the texture coat. Um, because the flat gray didn't hide the fact that you could still see the seams in the plies. Um, so really those paints were added for, for hiding the fact that Jasper didn't use full sheets of ply. And you can look inside any Gretsch, any Rogers, any Camp Co. Uh, that is of the Jasper era. And if you look through that paint, you look close enough, you will find the lines where That's interesting. the inside ply is made up of sheets. So it was fully a cosmetic decision, had nothing to do with tone, and still doesn't. I, I think maybe yeah. Roger's later edition of, of texture would would, would have, have an effect on tone, but so minimal. Yeah, but it's uh it's fun to <laughs> to be like on the you know the Facebook pages or the forums, people be like, oh no, you gotta use this specific kind of paint because it matches the original one most and it provides the most realistic sound to what it should be. And, uh, you know, it's kind of cool. It's kind of the, the, the history and the, um, the legacy and, and it, the, the debate rages on. Um. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and, and in the sense, like it's the least important way to do that. Uh, if, if you want to flawlessly reproduce a vintage, uh, Gretsch, you're going to put the silver sealer in there. Yeah, of, co- of um, course. Sure. Totally, I don't think it's going to help you as much 
as cutting the original bearing edge that they were using on the Gretsch that you like or the Rogers that you like. If your focus is on the paint and not on the edge, you're never going to get that sound. Because for the most sure. part, these, these brands, their sound came from the bearing edge. Their function came from the bearing edge. The shell is um, a pretty minimal factor. It, the way to think about the shell is there's two choices. There's hardwoods and there's softwoods. Um, some companies try to mix them. And in the same way that a, a drum head will default to a moon gel, if you have a loud resonant drum head and you put just a tiny little piece of uh, moon gel on there, now you have uh, an, a, a warmer, shorter decay. Yeah. So if you take a 50% maple shell and put in 50% poplar, that maple is going to default to the poplar. Hmm, You're going to hear. So in a sense, you might as well just buy the poplar drum and, and not even bother with uh, complicated mixes of different woods <laughs> and this type of, it's, that's it's too really easy. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's, there's so much stuff going on that people miss the, the, the simpler aspects because, you know, you get sucked into a lot of advertising campaigns and that, that hit me really hard. And, and uh, it wasn't until I could I could pick these things apart, um, you know, especially with customer feedback, that I realized that most of it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, you know, you course. can get into the different uh, mixes of metals in a ride symbol, but you either like thick ones or you like thin ones. Mm -hmm. And and if you go thicker, you're going to have a louder. Uh, more pinging, more projecting, more volume. And you're going to have a little bit less dynamic the way that a thin symbol will respond to your touch more. It'll have a breath. Sure. It'll have yeah. multiple different tones depending on where you hit it and how you hit it. A thick ride symbol will just ding no matter whether you're on the <laughs> but people, outside. Or th there's no wrong answer. That's the beautiful no. thing to... I think that's the takeaway I get from all this with the bearing edges and all this is, I don't know. I love how you said early on about how, you know, different than other any other instrument, even if you're playing a drum set that has, you know, rough bearing edges and maybe you can't afford right now to send it off to get, them, get it cut, you can still play it and still have fun because it's a drum. You know, you can hit it. You can, but like a hundred, whatever, 17 episodes deep into the show, I've learned that, boy, we can go very deep on everything and i think uh as we kind of wrap up here i think we've just touched the very 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 beginning of shells and construction so um <laughs> without spiraling yeah, and yeah the shell material if you have the most beautifully resonant shell in the world and it creates the exact tone that you want but you're not sitting on that right if you're not contacting that shell right you're never going to get the benefits of that stuff and, and when it comes to bearing edges, I feel like there, there isn't an opinion. It, it's, it's um, yes, can you make what you have work? You, you certainly can. Um, you can make anything work. But there are very few options for what tunes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and, true. And that's, that's the part that bothers me. Um a lot of the times with, with how drums are sold and how they're advertised, you can go out and buy a $300 Fender guitar, or you can buy a $5,000 Fender guitar. The one that has gone to a tech and was made more comfortable to play, more consistent to play, is the one that the guitar player is going to pick. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, when it comes to wood types or whatever, that's not going to dissuade anybody from having a good time. No. But I course. know a lot of drummers who will spend hours, if not days, trying to figure out how to get the drum to function. To yeah. just have, you know, you're lucky if you find that one note where your drum is happy. Yeah. And that's, and that's just ludicrous. Like, there's companies that will tell you, 
the shell produces this pitch, so this is the pitch where you want to tune. Yeah. But if you bought a violin or acoustic guitar that only voiced one pitch, <laughs> you wouldn't you would, be happy. No, you would chuck that thing. Yeah. And and really, when the company says, "Oh, you know, try to tune to this pitch or that pitch," what they're telling you is that. The edges on this drum are so poor. We want to try to find the one spot that you might be able to tune it. At. No, that's <laughs> well. All right, so let's tell people if they have a drum that they've been wrestling with and they want to send it to you and want to get some help because obviously you're you know extremely knowledgeable about this uh, this all. Um, where can they find you? What's a good contact uh, you know for you and and all that good stuff as we as we wrap up here. Um, I would say that there are people in your neighborhood. There's a budding industry in it, and I, I want to see it grow because I, I watch people struggle with um, issues on a drum set that they otherwise love um, that can be fixed for a hundred bucks or two. Hmm. And so really get on uh, Facebook groups, Instagram, and um Find people in your area. There is there there is at least a dozen folks who who I talk to regularly, and uh, and they know what they're doing, and they know how to make your drums perform better. Mm. Wow. And um and and get out there and talk to folks. Ultimately, the best bearing edge is reproducing the mold that made the head, and. If you talk to someone out there who's cutting bearing edges, custom drum builders, um, uh, a couple of drum shops, but mostly builders, and, and they understand that the mold that made the head is the best shape to use, um, those folks will, will, will change the way you look at your drums. And yeah. um, my, my, my contact would be... Uh, Curse Drums Portland on Instagram or uh, portlanddrums.com. There's there's a new website uh, being built right now. Sure. Um, you know how that stuff goes when you're a Luddite. It's kind of slow, but... Yeah, but well, people might listen to this a year from now and it'll be the current website or whenever you get yeah. it done. So, <laughs> so don't worry about that. But that's K-I-R-S-C-H drums. Uh, so Jeff is obviously in... You know, in Portland, you could probably guess from hearing portlanddrums.com. And uh, I think people should trust you with their drums or and I kind of like that you, your first answer was look in your own neighborhood and, and you can find people. But, um, you know, if they want to go to work specifically with you, they can obviously do that. Um, and Jeff is kind enough to take about uh, a couple extra minutes. I don't know if you still have time, Jeff. Hopefully you do. Um, and we'll do a quick bonus episode um, and talk about Jeff's, you know, personal quick story of how he got into this um, and learned how to cut bearing edges. I think that'll be really interesting. Um, do you, are you still good to do that, Jeff? Oh, absolutely. OK, so we'll wrap up here on the main episode and, uh, and we'll hop over to the bonus. So if you want to hear this bonus episode and many others, uh, you can go to drumhistorypodcast.com, click the Patreon link and donate a couple bucks a month and you get these bonus episodes and other cool stuff. So on that note, uh, Jeff, man, we just there's so much information I that we just jammed in there. I think we kind of oh, we touched need, on the wood, and there's plenty more to talk about there for a future episode. But um, oh, I I need another hour on edges actually, just alone. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's really you know there's there's so much talk about all the different types of uh, materials and lugs and this that and the other, and it, it's like all you need is the ability to tune. If, yeah, if you have the ability to tune and stay in tune. Um, you're going to have fun with whatever you have. And there are a lot of people out there who are working on, on this and, um, and, and helping folks get more out of their drums. And uh, yeah, hopefully if someone's listening to this in a couple of years, there's uh there's 20 more people out there who can put good bearing edges on your kit for you. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you very much to Mr. Jeff Kirsch for being on the show. And thank you to Dave Chapman and Richie Payne. Richie, I know we kind of talked a little bit about wood plies and I'll probably do more later down the road, but um, 
Anyway, yeah, thanks, Jeff, for being on the show. And I'm looking forward to our bonus conversation that we'll hop over and do now. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you very much. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.